you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As I said to the, to the kids up here, right, um, the Gospel of John has no transfiguration story as the normal Gospels do, right? Normally on this Sunday you would hear the story of Jesus going up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, right? And he would be up on the mountain and he would be transfigured and his clothing would be made wider than any white that anybody had ever seen. And he'd be standing there and he'd be talking to Moses and Elijah. It's interesting to wonder how the gospel writers at that point knew that it was Moses and Elijah. Because did they wear name tags that said, hello, my name is Moses, my name is Elijah, right? They probably didn't have that. But to this morning's text in the gospel of John is just as much a transfiguration text as those texts. It's more of a transformative text which, for us and for understanding who we are and how we live in the world. Okay? So, this morning I want to ask you, how many of you are blind? How many of you are blind? It's a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> Did you read the last part, right? How many of you can see? Did you read that last line in the, in the gospel lesson? Now that you say that you can see, your sin remains. That word remains there is meno, which is the word that means... Meno. What's meno, Kurt, in the Greek? Oh, he lets me down. That's okay. It's all good. Meno means abide. When Jesus came and menoed with us, he abided with us. What does that mean? He remains, right? So you're living in your sin if you say you can see. How many of us are blind? How many of us don't understand what's going on in the world? How many of us try to do things the right way and mess them up? How many of us seem to get things wrong all the time? And here in this story is Jesus talking to his disciples. And his disciples ask them a question. Who sinned, this man or his parents, so that... Who sinned? Because he's blind, right? In this day and age, somebody had to do something wrong in order for this man to be born blind. But here's the thing that we don't get. Where's the blind man when Jesus' disciples are talking to him and asking him these questions? Where is he? He's right next to him. The blind man is right there. As the disciples talk about this, and the disciples are saying, who, why, why is this guy blind? Who, who sent him or his parents? He's, he's overhearing the whole conversation. He's standing right there, and he hears it. And then Jesus bends over, right? It says a little bit later on in the, in the Sabbath, it says a little bit later on in the reading that this man doesn't uphold the Sabbath. And why does it say that? Because what did Jesus do? He spit on the ground and he made mud, so he actually worked. That, that little motion of stirring the spit in the dirt is work. You can't do that on the Sabbath. So he worked. And then he spread the mud over the guy's eyes, and he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And what did the blind man do? He got up. He went to the pool. He washed himself off. He didn't question what was going to happen. Jesus never told him what was going to happen. Jesus just spit on the ground and rubbed the stuff on the guy's eyes and said, go wash it off. And he did. That is as profound a faith statement as when Mary said to Gabriel, here am I, a servant of the Lord, do to me as the Lord wants. As a 14-year-old girl standing before the angel, knowing that she's going to become pregnant, knowing that the wedding that she's about to have isn't going to happen because she's going to give birth to a, to a child that is not her husband's. The blind man just gets up and goes to the pool and washes off. Doesn't ask Jesus what's going to happen. He just knows that something's going to happen and he goes. And then he gets questioned over and over and over again. You see these 41 verses here in the Gospel of John in this ninth chapter. We have the story of a man who's born blind and Jesus heals him. But the story is not about that because that's just like the first three verses. The next 39 verses talk about how people can't understand how this could happen. And they question it. 
Because that's what we want to do. We want to question everything. We want to know why things happen. And we want to know why things aren't done the way that they're supposed to be done. And we want to know why things need to be done in a particular way. The Pharisees spend their time questioning this man over and over again to the point where he gets to the, to the end there and he goes, I've already told you this how many times? Why do you keep asking me this? Do you really want to completely understand it so that you can also be his disciples? Which if you didn't catch the sarcasm in that, you missed something. Right? Because it's always about why things happen and the positions that we're put in and the things that we have to understand. And we're more on the questioning of what's going on rather than just looking and seeing God's grace all around us. Because there it is all around us. In the times that we screw up and we get brought back into that relationship. In the times that we, we do something that doesn't fit into what we thought it was going to and things don't work the way that we thought they did but they turn out even better than we could ever possibly imagine. Because God's grace is working in and through everything that happens around us all the time. And here's the thing that really caught my attention about these 41 verses. And it's in these first three verses. Right? Because, before we get to that, Jesus said a little bit after that in verse 5. I am the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And that is the transformative power that makes everything happen. Jesus being the light of the world. His light shines through us and in that we understand His grace. And in that we can see that we don't have to understand how things happen. But here's the verse that really caught my eye. Verse 3. Because the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that this man was born blind? And Jesus answered them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. Part of this sentence isn't even in the text. You see, the disciples wanted an answer for why this man was blind. So do we, right? So somebody had to screw up. Either this man sinned or his parents sinned. But here's the kick kicker on that, right? The man was born blind. So did he sin before he was born? But the disciples aren't going to just blame his parents. Right? But as I prepared for this text, I heard a commentary, and read a commentary from a, from a pastor who is a professor at Luther Seminary who talked about one of his students who was born without an arm, and someone in that congregation went to that that woman's parents and said obviously they had sinned because their daughter was born without an arm. That's pastoral, isn't it? Right? This, this same professor has also got cancer in the, in the, in the near recent history, or, or as he was a younger, not near recent, near recent meaning the last 30 years. Um, and someone went to his parents after he got diagnosed with cancer and said, told his mother that, that she had fed the family the wrong food because that's what gave her son cancer. We all want answers to things. We all want to know why things happen. So that's why the disciples asked Jesus this question. And Jesus doesn't say that things that we do don't have consequence because he says to them, right, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But in order that God's work might be revealed in him, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is still day, for night is coming when no one can work. Did you hear what I left out? Neither this man nor his parents sin, but so that God's work might be revealed in him, we must do what God has sent me to do while I'm here. That he was born blind is not in the text. It was put in there because we need an answer. Because that's what we want. Can't we just accept the fact that God's at work? And that things are going to happen that we don't understand. And that there's not always an explanation for something. Right? We don't have to get it. Because the disciples didn't get it. We just have to understand that God's grace is enough. And if we want to understand exactly how much God's grace is enough, there was a quote, I believe it was from Philip Yancey, I saw just yesterday or the day before. 
about how God saved a man on a cross. Jesus was hung on a cross next to two thieves. And one of them said, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus had full knowledge that this man was only doing this because he probably wanted to get down off of this cross. He knew that he was a man who deserved to be hung on that cross. He knew that he was never going to do anything to be able to repent. He knew that he probably wasn't baptized. And that maybe he was doing this out of his own will to get what he wanted and or needed at that point in time. But what did God do? God saved him. Because that's how much God's grace loves each and every one of us. And that's what we should see in this text. And that's what we should understand about being transformed or made into something new. That Jesus' light so shines through our lives that it doesn't matter if we get it. It's all because God's grace is enough and will heal every ill. And it doesn't have to be explained why it happened. It just has to understand that that's what God does for those whom he loves. So be like the blind man. And let Jesus spit on the ground and put mud on your eyes. And then go and wash. And then tell everybody about what happened. Because that grace was enough to give you the sight to see that you can't do anything without Jesus. Because that's what he means at the end. Because you say you can see, you remain in your sin. But if you would realize that you need to be blind and re rely on my love and my grace and my light to give you direction then you'll be able to live a life that's beyond all imagination. So live in that grace and go and share it with all of the world and remember what Jesus did for each and every one of us and that His grace is always enough.